and let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and get started. Plus, like everything I do, it's kind of meaty. There's a lot of stuff here because the topic to me is kind of meaty. So I am Joanna Brandy. I teach leaders to create more positive, productive, and profitable cultures. I've been doing it for 34 years. I'm a chief happiness officer, certified chief happiness officer, certified chief wellness officer. But what you really need to know about is the 34 years I've spent inside other people's companies trying to find out why their customer loyalty wasn't working. And in the end, I found out, that's okay, thanks, Emma. Uh, in the end, I found out that in almost every case, if they're having a problem with customers, I ended up in the corner office because the problem wasn't with their customers, their problem was with their culture. So that's how I ended up. And you're, you're nodding your head because we all, we all know that's usually the case. So you're nodding your head. Uh, I have studied with people all over the country and my most amazing teacher was Dr. Angelise Arian, who is a cross-cultural anthropologist. So I bring to my work things that come from outside the business world, which I think is important. So let me grab my PowerPoint presentation and we'll go ahead and get started. All righty, let's get me, let's get me going here. Come on. The little thing is spinning. There we go. There we go. Well, I already did my little introduction, so that part's great. So I'm here to talk to you today about something I call positive spillover. In all these years I've been in business, I've been learning from my clients. I've been learning from everybody because I'm, I'm that kind of person. So what happens in your organization is the culture in the organization spills over outside the organization. So when there's satisfaction and happiness and appreciation, stimulation at work, when you have a high level of energy or positivity, what happens is that you create what I call positive spillover. It moves outside the business into the lives of your families, into the lives of the, the, your, your customers, your suppliers, your communities, because Emotion travels. We're going to learn a lot about emotion today. Emotion travels. So what happens is that it spills over. Now, there's also something called this negative spillover. That's called negative spillover. And you have, may have run into this. That's when the conflicts at work begin to drain and preoccupy people, negatively impacting their behavior and experiences with families and experiences with partners, and it deteriorates the relationships at home. Years ago, I worked with the um, aid to victims of domestic abuse, and I can tell you for sure, when someone is demeaned and demoralized and put down at work, they come home mean, they come home angry. And there has been some research done on toxic cultures that say that children whose parents work in toxic cultures are likely to bully other children at school because emotions travel. So when you have negative spillover, it's an energy drain. You're sucked, you're sucked dry at work and you've got nothing to give to anybody else. But when you have positive spillover, when you've got happiness, when you've got satisfaction, I call this an energy gain. And my work is about how can we create more energy gains and forget those energy drains. So that's positive culture spills over. It has more positive impact. It touches more people than you know. We know for sure that when you have a positive interaction with someone, that it will travel to at least two to three more people after that person leaves you. Oh, positivity travels. And the profits are tangible and intangible when you deliberately create a positive culture. You get that energy gain. Now I call this, let's see, this is called a future map. And I work on a future map 
when I work with CEOs and I work for 26 or 27 years with Vistage, which is the world's largest CEO organization. And this is my favorite exercise. I, I create a map for them that I put down on paper. I gather four or five CEOs in a group and I teach them about this future map. So when you create a positive workplace culture, what happens? Well, let's say you get happy customers. When you create happy customers, what happens? They buy more stuff. They give you some positive word of mouth, which means your marketing expenses go down. They give you referrals, which means your marketing expenses go down and your profits go up. So for each one of these, I call them bubbles. For each one of these bubbles, you could put the first effect of that positive culture. So we might say the positive workplace culture gives us happy employees. Well, once our employees are happy, what happens? Well, they get more productive. They get more creative. They enjoy coming to work more. So you can see how this map fills out just beautifully when you've got five people working on it together. This is what it looks like when we start. It is called a future map because in each one of these, you're saying, and then what happens? So when you create this, then this happens. And when you create this, then this happens. And then this happens. And then this happens. This is one of the tools I use in my consulting practice. And I absolutely love it. You can use this in any area of your life. Depends on what you put in the middle. For today, we're putting positive workplace culture in the middle. So when I work with CEOs and work on uh, that map, it's all filled up when they finish. It's all filled up. Then I say to them, okay, I want you to go and take a different color pen. If you have a red pen, use a red pen. And I want you to put a dollar sign on any one of the bubbles where you're either making money or saving money. And it is profound because almost every single time Every one of the bubbles has a dollar sign on it in red. And then I ask them, oh, well, what's your conclusion about creating a positive workplace culture? And here's what they say. Everything here, meaning on their map, is either going to bring me money or save me money. I'm going to urge you to do this internally because it is fun. And it is the kind of thing will, which it will just open your eyes up and say, oh, I never thought of that. Because we don't make those connections. And we know that when you work hard at creating a positive culture, you get higher retention, lower burnout, more effort, faster innovation, high trust, retain talent, and people are six times more likely to recommend you. These are the hundred, this is analysis of the hundred best companies, you know, the companies that win all those awards, the people in those companies are beating, if there's, that's the Russell 3000 and the Russell 1000. Look at that peak, just look at that peak. So it went down a little bit during COVID, but still look at that difference. So the great places to work tell us that when we do these things, we beat the market. I don't know why we don't do it on a regular basis, but I think that's because it's challenging. Happy people have 65% more energy than unhappy ones. And in the world's largest well-being study, they found out that happy employees are more productive. And when you talk to employees, they go, of course. When I'm happy, I work better. When I'm happy, I enjoy being there. But for some reason, we forget this. I don't know why, but for some reason, we forget it. So workplace well-being, job satisfaction, having purpose at work, and this is coming up a lot now, being stress-free, not that any of us is stress-free, but creating an environment where there is less stress, giving people the tools they need to deal with stress is becoming more and more important. Now, the interesting thing about it, this is Don Yan, uh, Dr. Jan Emmanuel Deneuve, and he says that 87% of leaders know this. They agree that happiness can give them a competitive advantage, but only 35% make it a strategic priority. So I'm curious about, do the people that you work with make happiness a strategic priority? My experience tells me that the word happiness scares people. 
that's what my experience tells me. Now you can use the word productivity. There's a lot of things you can use there, but the word happiness itself seems to scare people because CEOs don't seem to want to be responsible for people being happy. They want people to be happy, but they don't look at it as a strategic priority. But they're going to have to start looking at it soon because we're, we're finding there's a real problem in the workplace. This is the Surgeon General's report on mental health and well-being. 76% of U.S. workers reported one symptom of a mental health condition. 84% said their workplace conditions had contributed to a mental health challenge. And 81% of the workers reported that they'll be looking for workplaces that support their mental health in the future. Now, this is interesting because the younger the worker, the more likely that they're having challenges at work that, that speak to their mental health. And there are lots of reasons for that. You know, they're growing up in a very different time than, for instance, when I grew up. And they're stressed. They don't, they're worried about climate change. They're worried about whether or not they'll ever be able to afford a house. They've got a different set of worries than people, let's say, in my generation did. So workplace mental health, we have to start addressing it. We have to start giving people what they need to feel happy and healthier at work. And in the end, again, 34 years of teaching, guess what, folks? It's all about the F word. Feelings. How do they feel? How do they feel when they are at work? How do they feel about their work? My people need to feel. My people need to feel. Well, there's two sets of needs that everybody has. We have our business needs. So we have to be well paid. If we're working in person, we may want that office to be close to home. If working at home is a priority, we may want to make sure that we get to stay home and do some of our work there, right? So the business needs, the right salary, the right equipment, those are tangible needs. But people have personal needs, which are emotional and may even be illogical. They're certainly intangible and occasionally they're irrational. But let's just talk about for a moment because I do this exercise in every workshop. My people need to feel. Anyone, anybody wanna unmute and just shout out what your people need, a couple of things your people need to feel? quiet. Oh, somebody, I think, I think I just heard somebody on mute. Well, I'll fill in some of the blanks because I've done it so many times. My people need to be, my people need to feel heard. My people need to feel valued. My people need to feel understood. My people need to feel appreciated. Sometimes when I'm doing a list, that one comes on the bottom. I don't know why because people really need to feel appreciated. People need to feel appreciated. I'm gonna check the chat box. It looks like there may be some of those things in there. People need to feel trusted. Okay, people need to feel trusted. People need to feel connected. Absolutely, absolutely. Anything else you wanna put in the chat box? I'll watch that for a moment. I'm guessing if we had time to really brainstorm this, you'd come up with 25 items on that list. People need to feel challenged, but not scared, not pushed outside their comfort zone so much that they're trembling. People need to feel well compensated. People need to, I believe people need to feel happiness at work. There's so many things that people need to feel. I will challenge you to do this list at work. Go around and ask people, hey, what do you need to feel when you're at work? And you will find that these things are not terribly hard to do, but first you have to understand them. Now, I use a phrase that you might not understand. It's called, are you positively deviant? This is called the bell curve of normal distribution. And in any group of normal distribution, so let's say these are companies, on one side, you're gonna have your low performers, in the middle, that's where most people, average people are gonna be there in the middle. And on the right side, gonna be your high performers. Those are the companies that get elected as a great place to work. Those are the places where people love coming to work, where they feel good, where they, they can act out their purpose at work, where they're solidly present. Now, those people are deviant. I call them 
positively deviant because you're deviating from the norm. If you want to be a great company, you're positively deviant. Now, the challenge here is that 67% of your success as a leader depends on your EQ, not your IQ, your emotional intelligence, not how smart you are. So all of this leads into positive leadership. What is positive leadership? Well, it's not the negative. It's not the opposite of negative leadership. What is positive leadership? It's an intentional style of leadership. It energizes people, it elevates people, and it invites people to bring their best selves to work. It uses evidence-based science. So we use positive psychology. We use neuro, we use um, neuro, things like neuroplasticity. We use sports medicine. We use some of this evidence-based science to help people create more of what they're good at. It's strengths-based. We look at what works and that's called positive deviance. So when I go into a company, the first thing I wanna know is what's working? What's working? Not what's broken and needs to be fixed, but what's working? Because you start from the straight. It's value-based. So there's a little two next to that value. So the first way that I describe value is the kind that you create. So there's one question that you can ask yourself and your team that will, I promise you, change your business. And that's the question, how can I add value? If you get up in the morning and say to yourself, how can I add value at work today? What's gonna happen? The brain works on questions, right? So if you ask that question, how can I add value over and over again, your brain is gonna be very happily tell you how you can add value. If you're a manager and you encourage this in your people, they're going to create more value. I think it's a very, very important phrase. How can I add value? And of course, the phrase, how can you add value? So as a team, how can we add value? How do we add value to the customer experience? How do we add value to the employee experience? Because the purpose of a business is to create customers. The purpose of the customers is to create the funds necessary to keep the business going. So we're always oriented towards that customer experience. So how can you create value in the customer experience? How can you create value in the employee's experience? And the second value that I talk about there is your values, your personal values and your business values. As a team, do you share values? Have you defined those values? Do you know how the values play out in behavior? Very, very critical. When I work with teams, often we do something called an outside in values process where we invite everyone in the company to join us in understanding values. So we begin by the individuals understanding what their own values are. Because if you don't understand your own values, how are you gonna live the company values? So we start with that. And then we come together only for the people that wanna do it. Because you can't make people do this stuff. They have to willingly volunteer to do it. So then we come together as a group and start talking about values. And if a company has a set of values to start with, we start talking about those values. Are they still relevant? Do they still work? Do they still represent who we are as a company? And then we work with them and tweak them because positive leadership is based on your values. And when everybody knows what your values are, how those values are defined and what it looks like in behavior when they show up and when they don't show up, that makes a huge difference. Beautiful, yeah. Values are so important. More important now than ever. That's what's really interesting is that this is more important now from ever, than ever before. Now, positive leadership is authentic. You can't fake your way through it. You know, it has to come from your heart. It's got to be there. And when you create more positive leadership, you're increasing your positive capacity in the organization. 
and that to your ability and your organization's ability to create, experience, and expand on all the many benefits of positive emotions for the good of all your stakeholders. Positive emotions make us healthier. Positive capacity impacts all your business results. And of course, happy people produce more. So nine out of 10 people report being more productive in the presence of other positive people. You can understand that, I'm sure. But when we look at happy employees, and this is t- this took 225 studies and put it together, this 31% higher productivity when we got happy people, 37% more higher sales, because sales is a profession that relies on optimism, right? And now we know that people become three times to 10 times more creative when they are in positive moods. One of my teachers, Barbara Fredrickson, explains that beautifully. She calls it the broaden and build response. When your body is producing the chemicals like dopamine and oxytocin and serotonin and endorphins, what happens in your brain is that the right hemisphere of your brain and the left hemisphere of your brain begin communicating better. So your brain works better on positivity. So you become more creative. One of my uh, affiliates tells me that when she does research, she's seen 300 to 400% more rates of innovation in companies with happy employees. And the happiest places to work tells us that happy people are more adaptable to change. What do we need now? We need adaptable people. It, it's just crazy. We, the world is crazy right now. So we need people that can adapt to it with a, with a positive state of mind. People are more engaged and people tend to stay in places where they're happy. Now we grow up believing that happiness is an unalienable right, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But my wonderful teacher, Angelise Arian, when I started studying happiness said to me, Joanna, did you know that in Thomas Jefferson's day, the word pursuit actually meant practice. It didn't mean you chase after it, you practice it. So maybe he didn't mean we're supposed to be chasing, we're supposed to be practicing. See, happiness is a practice. It's a process, it's not a place. It's a good habit. It's a skill that you can learn and practice over and over again. For me, it's a work ethic. For me, it's, I have to work at happiness. I am not naturally happy. A portion of your happiness is genetic. So some people, as you know, because you have kids and you grew up in families and you see some people are just naturally happier than others. I'm not one of them. So I have to work at it. So for me, happiness is a work ethic. Now, here's the cool thing is the more you practice it, the more it actually changes your brain because the neurons that fire together, wire together. So the more you practice, the more you wire in, this is called neuroplasticity. The more you practice happiness, the happier you become. It actually changes your brain. So I want you to think of it as a muscle that you exercise. Now, it doesn't just feel good. It happens to be really good for you because of the chemicals that your body produces. It has been called the new productivity, as it should. And I think it's a competitive business strategy because it's not quite so easy to do. It, it's not like you're, you know, you're, you've got a new advertising strategy or something where you can hire a company to just tell you what to do. You really have to work with your people. So positive emotions make us smarter. They dial up the learning centers in our brain. They broaden and build. They make us healthier because they produce the chemicals of calm, which are the chemicals that, that are, turn on our parasympathetic nervous system, which is what heals us. So they make us healthier and they, and they produce T cells. So if you want to avoid getting sick and catching the next round of whatever's going around, you want to create more positive emotions in your body. So it creates more T cells. Those are the fighter cells that fight off viruses and colds. They make us more uh, socially adept. And now there's evidence that happiness makes us wealthier. The other thing happiness does is it helps you to achieve the upper levels of your potential no matter what you're doing. So if you're a chef and you're happy, you're gonna cook better. If you're a musician and you're happy, you're gonna play better. If you're an athlete and you're happy, you're gonna compete better. No matter what you're doing, if you do it while you are experiencing positive emotions, 
you're going to do it better. That's what coaching does, right? That's what your coach does. They encourage you to feel strong. They encourage you to use your strengths. They encourage you to get out there and do a great job. We have learned that it doesn't work to embarrass people. Well, it used to maybe, but it doesn't work to embarrass people to get them to perform better. We have to encourage people to get them to perform better. And the cool news is there are so many positive emotions. Uh, I think for so many years, especially I became a happiness coach uh, 20 years ago. And oh my God, did I get looks from people like, you know, they thought Pollyanna was going to bounce into the room. Uh, and I had to say, you know, I'm not that kind of happy person. <laughs> There's lots of happiness. Positive emotions come in all shapes and sizes. So there are the there are the excitable positive emotions. And then there's the quiet positive emotions like serenity and security or just feeling special. All of these things will give you the benefit of positive emotions. And I love them. The one I've been studying the most now is awe because there are two new books out on awe. And they're amazing because you can create awe. You don't have to go to the Grand Canyon to create awe. You can create awe in very, very small, tight places. I have a little rock on my desk. And I know, my little blue rock here, I know that if I want to create awe, which will change the chemistry in my body, I can sit here very quietly and take a really close look at this rock. And when I take a really close look at this rock, I see all sorts of colors. I see all sorts of shapes. It's very smooth. You can create awe. Now that's more of what I'm gonna deal with on Thursday, which is a little bit more of the, the positivity for your personal life as well. But they, they weave together very beautifully. Now, something we really need to understand is that the brain processes, processes negative emotions different than positive emotions. So negative emotions stick like Velcro. This is Dr. Rickanson's work. Negative emotions stick like Velcro. There's a reason for that. There's an evolutionary purpose for how our brain deals with a negative emotion. When we are negative, it implants itself in more than one place in the brain. So we see something negative and something says, uh-oh, I better file that because I may come back here again and I need to know it's dangerous. So that goes right into your in, in, into the primal part of the brain so that when you walk down that street again, you, you know you're in danger. And, and evolutionary, when you think about it from that perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Positive emotions, on the other hand, whoop, like Velcro, uh, like, I'm sorry, like Teflon, they just slide the hell off. They just, you know, oh, what a nice day. Boom, slides right off, which is why you need to spend a little bit more time in a positive emotion in order for it to stick. Barbara Fredrickson, another one of my teachers, teaches us that we need three times more positivity than negativity to get into a state of flourishing. Three times more positivity than negativity. She has a book and a website called PositivityRatio.com. And what happens when we get that three times more positivity is that our brain is rewiring. This is neuroplasticity. So you can train your brain to be happier because neurons that fire together, wire together. Neurons that fire together, wire together. So you can train your brain to be happier, which is what I've been doing for a long time. But at work, what do we want? We want the high performance ratio. Now the high performance ratio is five to one. Five times more acknowledgement, five times more affirmation, five times more praise, five times good work, goodwill, five times more recognition, five times more compliments and focus on strengths than sarcasm, criticism, cynicism, or corrective actions related to weakness. Now I have to tell you that when CEOs see this slide, it's frightening because we haven't been thinking like this yet. We need five times more questions that are focused on what's strong rather than what, what went wrong. Five times more focused on what's right and what we wanna create rather than on what needs to be fixed and what you don't want. You see, the brain is not designed for happiness. The brain is designed to keep us safe. And we haven't had an upgrade in the hardware in more than 250,000 years. 
So the brain is always looking for what's wrong. And any good business person knows you do have to look for what's wrong. But if you want to deliberately create a positive culture and a high performance culture, it requires a shift in thinking. So we have to start looking for different things. This is something that I found out unrelated to the field of positive psychology is that happy marriages also have a five to one ratio. And that's Dr. John Gottman and his wife who have been studying happy marriages for 40 years. So two unrelated bodies of work tell us that you know what? You need way more positivity than negativity. Five eggs for you. So these positive emotions add up. I don't know exactly how I first drew this, this picture, but I was at a workshop and I was trying to explain to people how, how we calibrate emotions. And I used the example of going on vacation. So I said, you know what? We have a little checklist in our head. It has a plus column and a minus column. So let's imagine this. You're planning on going on vacation. So you go on the website and you find this beautiful resort and you love what you see. So you've got check marks going in the plus column. You're pretty sure it's within your price range. You've got, you've got check marks going in the plus column. Oh, they have reservations just when you need them. Uh, check marks going in the plus column. Now the vacation comes and you get to this island that you decided to go to. And the airport is not very friendly and you can't find your luggage. You got plus mark, you got check marks going in the minus column. And you get to the resort and the first thing you do is you smell mildew. Oh, you've got check marks going in the minus column. So we do this every day, all day with every situation that we're in, with a call to a customer service department, with a call, with a conversation with a salesperson, in a conversation with people that we work with. We're always sort of putting a check mark in one area or the other. We're always letting that add up to, was that a good experience? Did the good outweigh the bad? So it's really important with employees and with other people that you work with and your customers to build emotional bank accounts. So when you listen for the opportunity to acknowledge someone, to recognize them, to affirm what they've done, to celebrate them, to anchor what they're doing, to appreciate and give positive feedback to them, you're making a deposit in an emotional bank account. And every time you do that, what you're doing is you're adding relevance to the relationship. You're adding value and you're building your emotional bank account and theirs. So I want you to remember this little drawing and maybe draw your own. Uh, remember this little drawing that you have the opportunity to build your emotional bank account and their emotional bank account in the same conversation. Now, this becomes, I think, very, very important. 30% of your financial results are gonna come directly from the climate in your culture, from the climate in your culture. Where does the climate come from? The climate comes from you. 50 to 70% of how your employees perceive the climate at work is due to the actions of the leaders. Let it land. 50%, 50 to 70% of how your employees perceive the climate at work, which is connected to financial results, it's due to the actions of the leaders. So leaders play such an important part in the profitability of a company. Because when you create the kind of climate that people want to come and work in, it becomes more profitable. You know, I've, I've had a lot of years of studying and one of the teachers I studied with, excuse me, was Dr. Olaf Isaacson. Me. He wrote, well, he wrote many books, but the one I know is The Entrepreneurial Elite. 
And I was in a session with him one day and these words came out of his mouth. And I, I was like nailed to the chair because I had never thought about it before. He said, you can't motivate people. But what you can do is you can create an environment where people feel good about themselves in your presence. I'm going to say it one more time because I'm telling you it like nailed me to the chair. You can't motivate people. But what you do is create the climate, the environment where people feel good about themselves in your presence. And to me, that's like the, the essence of leadership, the essence of leadership. And now I have been a leader in the corporate world. I, I'm not just a consultant. I've been a leader in the corporate world. And I understand, I understand that sometimes you have to look at behavior that is not up to the standard you're looking for. However, a positive leader knows how to deal with that because a positive leader is always looking for people's strengths and giving them feedback based on their strengths. So when you know, it's, it's just like that little checklist in the brain. When, when, you, when your boss, excuse me, keeps finding the things you do right and commenting on them, and telling you what a good job you're doing and how the good job you're doing fits in with the corporate or the business's purpose, you're going to feel good. You're going to feel good. You're going to feel valued. Well, when I feel valued, it's way easier for me to take feedback that's not quite as positive as the feedback I get every day. That's a five to one ratio again. So when you're looking for people's strengths, when you're talking to them about their strengths, when you're telling them how their strengths fit in with the, with the, the mission of the business, when you're having those conversations, people start feeling really good about themselves. And when they know that you see them at their best, they are more willing to hear what I call constructive feedback. Let's banish the phrase constructive criticism. I don't care how constructive it is. If you're criticizing me, you're criticizing me. So positive in, in positive leadership, uh, we, we, have, we use a different language. We actually create a different language. I have an online positive leadership course at positiveenergizer.com. And my favorite way to work in it is to put groups together because then we all learn to to create the new language together. It's, it's just, it's so, it's beautiful to watch. It's just beautiful to watch. So the question is, what are you broadcasting? Because we're all broadcasting energy all the time. So what are you broadcasting? And when are you broadcasting? So when you come in the morning, is your head down? How are you vibrating, right? How are you vibrating? Well, this is one of the most important questions ever. What are you broadcasting? Are you broadcasting positivity? Are you broadcasting worry? Are you broadcasting fear? Are you broadcasting uh, negativity? Are you broadcasting hope? Are you broadcast? What are you broadcasting? So if you go back to yesterday and think about it, what were you broadcasting yesterday at two o'clock? Anybody want to share that? What were you broadcasting yesterday at two o'clock? Dissatisfaction, satisfaction, joy, happiness. Were you pleased at something? Anybody want to unmute, unmute and join the conversation? I'll also go to the chat box. See if anybody wants to put something in there. What were you broadcasting yesterday? No, not willing? All right, well, that's okay. But it's a question. That's really, really important to ask yourself. What am I broadcasting? I had experience working with uh, was one of my first clients, actually. One of my first clients uh, when I still lived in New York out on Long Island. And um, it was, this, these were two brothers that ran an industrial supply company. And one of the brothers, a delightful man, but he was always focused on what his work was. So he would come in in the morning and he would head right towards his inbox. There were people on either side of him 
but he didn't look at them because he was only focused on what he had to do that day. And I knew it was a problem because there was a lot of dissatisfaction. People were always saying things like, what kind of mood is he in today? I'm sure you've had that situation at work. What kind of mood is he in today? And, and so it took, it took about three months to convince him that he was not to go to his inbox, that he was to say good morning to people, that he was to shake their hands, that he was to ask them about their children. He was a loving guy, but he just had such intense focus that people thought that he was ignoring them. It became very, very important. And, and like I said, it took us three months to convince them. So what are you broadcasting? You see, there's an electromagnetic field all around your body. And the electromagnetic field that's the most positive is the electromagnetic field around your heart. At any given time, you can drop into your heart. Take a few deep breaths. Think about something you truly appreciate. And it will change what you're broadcasting. That's why appreciation is so important. I teach something called an appreciation audit. Five times a day, this is hard work. Five times a day, I want you to write down three things that you appreciate. And they can't be the same three things that you did before. Different three things every time. Now, I suggest that you pair that with something else you do five times a day, and it's usually getting a glass of water. So as you're sipping your water and hydrating your body, you can think about three things that you appreciate. And if you want to wire this in as a practice, you write them down. I have clients that make these little notepads up so that, so that people can write them down on the little positivity notepads. You see, the vibration of appreciation is a little different than the vibration of frustration. So when you're frustrated, that's what people are picking up. But when you're in a state of appreciation for your staff, for whatever happened that morning, for whatever, when you're in that state of appreciation, people are picking up something very different. Now, we all know you can walk into a room where somebody's had an argument and feel it. We all know that, but we don't talk about it much. See, we are, we are, we are energetic beings and we feel each other's energy. So in a, in a positive climate, we feel each other's positive energy. It's the vibration of appreciation. So just to give you a teeny bit of background, when I started my business, I really didn't know what I was doing. I quit my corporate job because I was done with it. But I really didn't know at first. I knew I wanted to teach customer care and customer loyalty, but it took me a while to really understand what my role was, what my mission was. And then one day I got a vision while meditating and I saw it, the business, a business sitting on a tripod, three legs. In order for the business to be stable, the legs have to be even. And what do the legs represent? They all represent a different set of relationships. So we have our external relationships with our customers, with our suppliers, with our communities, with the families of those who work for us. That's external. Those relationships have to work. Then we have these internal relationships, the people on our team, people above us, below us, however, however you phrase it people on our team, but there's one other relationship that has to work. And that's the inner relationship. How do I feel about my work? How do each and every one of your employees feel about their work? Do they get up in the morning with a smile on their face and go, yes, I get to create some value today? Or do they drag their ass out of bed? It's like, oh crap, I have to go to work. Now, of course, those are two extremes, but somewhere in the middle is the truth. How can we create the kind of environment at work where people get up in the morning and say, I get to go to work today. Not I have to go to work today. I get to go to work today. I get to deal with people today. I get to create value today. That's a real important distinction. So the strategies for positive leadership, should you want to go any further with positive leadership, have to do with cultivating positive emotion by creating positive climate, positive relationships, positive communication, and positive meaning, which is becoming more and more important in these days. And you're the leader that's cultivating that. So if you want to deliver wow experiences to your 
customers? Well, you can't do that with a ho-hum culture. You just can't. So when you build an optimistic culture that's coherent, aligned, strong, and focused on creating positive experiences, what you've created is an organism that can outthink, outdelight, and outmove your competition. So kind of crazy times, right? So I think leaders need new strategies and tools. I think customers and employees are going to continue to seek positive customer experiences from the companies with whom they choose to do business. And I will tell you something, having dealt with a customer service issue for the last two days, having to do with putting on this presentation and trying to reach someone in customer service in two different companies, leaves you with a really bad feeling sometimes when you can't get help and you need it. So we really have to take a look at how we're delivering our customer experiences because customers are seeking positive experiences and not necessarily just a conversation with a robot, especially when there's, when there's something critical happening. So companies need to reliably produce experiences that are authentic, easy, valuable, and relevant. And then customers come back and they bring their friends and they bring more money. So you only get those experience as an outgrowth of a culture that's focused on people, on positivity, and on well-being. So I have a special report for you, 12 ways to turn your workplace into a happy place. All you need to do is point your phone at that, and it will take you right over to where you can download the special report. And it will put you on my newsletter list, which if you don't like it, you can, you can, uh, you can get off of it. It's a great, it's a great value. I have been writing a newsletter for, uh, well, I've been writing a newsletter for 35 years, 34 years, but I've been writing a newsletter for the last four years. It's changed its tone quite a bit because I'm in my wisdom years. So I want to give you a lot of the wisdom that I have. So take a picture of that. And uh, at positiveenergizer.com, you can find our e-course uh, and you can take an assessment there to see how much of a positive leader you already are. And you can always find me. So that's my email address, got the newsletter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn, is my LinkedIn there? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, we're on LinkedIn three to five times a week. I'm out there with this stuff and I'm very accessible uh, if you need a little bit of advice or you just want to talk about this. So is there a return on happiness? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a big return on happiness. That's the name of my website, returnonhappiness.com. There's a huge return on happiness in all kinds of ways, energy, enthusiasm, meaning, psychological health, physical health, flexibility, respectfulness. But you know what? In the end, it, do it does drop to the bottom line. So when you invest in happiness, you're investing in your company. So I'm going to escape out of here and I am going to stop sharing my screen and see if I can see some of you lovely people and entertain a few questions. Let me go to the chat, see if there's any questions in the chat. I don't see any. Who's got a question? Who's got a question? Ask me questions. It's what I'm here for. We have another seven minutes or so, six minutes. It's what I'm here for. You can turn your camera on or not. I can hear you if you unmute yourself. You must have one question after all of that. Hi, um, here's Maria Aviles. How are you? I'm very well. I'm always excited when I'm doing this. Great. Um, I was wondering if you have any um, strategies to kind of snap out of an annoyed um, state to get into a more positive one. I have to turn the sound up just a little bit. I'm not hearing you clearly. So say that again. Strategies for? To snap out of like an annoyed um, state of being to get into a more positive state. The quickest road is appreciation. The quickest road is appreciation and gratitude. So when you can focus on those things that you're grateful for, it changes your chemistry. So my way of doing that is going outside, going outside. Okay, so like a walk and then a walk gratitude. in nature will always do it, but the, the but it needs to be a gratitude walk. 
So you go out into nature and you you look at the beautiful trees that are around you and you say to yourself, I'm so grateful for those trees. They provide shade. They provide a place for the birds to live. They provide, you really need to get into why you're grateful. Now, when you're doing that, you're creating a different chemistry in your body. The same thing with the appreciation audit, the two ways, and they're slightly different. Gratitude and appreciation are slightly different, but that's the surest way is to get yourself into a good state. The other thing that you can do is go help someone else. So if you're in an office, you can walk down the hall and you can say, hey, can I help you with that? Is there anything I can do to help you? Can I get you a cup of coffee? Because the other way to create, to create the change in yourself is by doing for another. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. I see something in the chat. Oh, thank you, Emma. I try to be inspiring. It's part of my signature. My signature. Yeah, I, wanted, I wanted to add one thing to the, your last comment there. Years ago, I heard of something, it was called, like I have a smooth little rock that I put in my pocket. And every time I stick my hands in my pocket and I touch that rock, it's like a gratitude rock. I think of something I'm grateful for. So I might even be in a good mood. I might be in a sour mood. It doesn't matter. Every time you touch that item, you think of something you're grateful for. So it kind of keeps you in a more upbeat kind of a situation. Absolutely. And you can you can infuse the rock. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you can say, I actually have a I actually have a rock that says gratitude next to my bed to remind me before I go to sleep at night that, you know, I don't care what kind of day it was. What were you grateful for? Right. And really peel it down, Diane. You know, if even when things are going really, really bad, if you can be grateful for the fact that we have running water, yep. that you have a roof over your head, there are so many people that are less fortunate. And as soon as you shift over into that gratitude, you begin to change the chemistry. I will tell you one thing. I want you to stay there for at least 24 seconds. And I use the, the number 24. What comes out of science is 17, but I think we all count too fast. So get into the grateful space, but stay there long enough for the gratitude to change your body chemistry. We, we skip, we, we live in a very negative culture. We skip over the positive stuff too fast. So stick your hand in your pocket, hold on to your rock, and, and stay there for 24 seconds. That'll change it for you. See, that's the great part about it too, is you might not even be in a bad mood and you stick your hand in your pocket and you feel it. You might even be in a good mood. So you think of something you're grateful for and it just keeps you in that positive, upbeat type feeling a lot, you know? I know. That's what I've noticed throughout the years. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that. So important. When we, it's so important when we share those positive experiences because there's so, there's, like I said, a lot of negativity in the world. So when we make a point, now one thing I do with all the people I work with, we start a meeting with something positive. We start every meeting with what happened to you last week that's positive. What are you grateful for? There's There is some version of that that always goes on to pull people together at the beginning of a meeting. And we always end a meeting with what I call an appreciation circle, which, by the way, we can do right here. We're a very small group of people. And that's just to end something by, by saying, what's one thing about today's presentation that you appreciate? And that get that leaves everybody on the same page when you walk out of the room. You ever, you ever, you ever have those meetings where... Um, you know, everybody nods their head before they leave, but then they go walk. They walk out into the hallway, and there's another conversation or two or three going on. Yes, I used to have that happen all the time in the corporate world. We'd split up and go down different hallways, and everybody had something to say about the meeting that they never said in the meeting. When you end a meeting with appreciation, and and what we appreciate at the end of the meeting is something that happened in the meeting, not your cat, your dog, or whatever. It. When you you could do that in the beginning, I'm grateful that I've got a cute little puppy. But at the end of the meeting, it's more like I really appreciate how we work together as a team, or I really appreciated what Diane said when she told us about her gratitude rocks. We get very specific, so people know what it is. 
because when we become aware of that, we can repeat that behavior. That makes sense? I don't know. Yes, that makes sense. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have another question? Does anybody else want to express appreciation to anybody who showed up to the to the organizers, to Eventbrite, to the robot? <laughs> anybody? Yes, I'll chime in again. I'm very appreciative of your time um, for going through this presentation. And um, I appreciate learning how impactful a leader's um, energy can be to the productivity of the team. It's amazing, isn't it? Yes, um, very enlightening. I, I mean, I guess intuitively I kind of knew, but just to see it with the numbers um, has made an impact for sure. It's um a lot of this stuff is intuitive, but it wasn't until I learned the science that it became that impactful for me either. So it was the same thing. You know, we all know it's important to be good. We all know it's important to be positive. But when I started studying the science, oh my gosh. So, well, thank you all for thank showing. You. Appreciate that you took the time. Uh, there will be a recording available. I would say if you want the recording, because I'm not sure the Eventbrite worked right. So I'm not sure I have your email addresses. I don't know. So if you want the recording, you might want to pop me an email. I'm Joanna at returnonhappiness.com. And you can send me an email there. Or just tell me how you felt about the program or ask me for a copy of the recording once we get it. And I am grateful, grateful, grateful. And Rebecca, thank you for hanging in there in case we had an issue. Uh, I really appreciate you taking your time today too. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a marvelous day. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you for your time. Oh, my pleasure. And knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of years to learn this stuff. All right, take care. I'm going to close the Zoom room right now. Bye-bye.